Revolt! Revolt! Revolt, you thick-skulled idiots! You have carried heavy burdens for the bosses. You have sweat your lives away for the bosses. The bosses, they ride around in limousines. Get the fuck off my car! Bosses, they're eating strawberries and cream. <laughs> that funny cat's a real boss. <laughs> All right, what's going on here? Break it up! Hello and welcome to Comic Book Movie Oblivion, the podcast about feature films based on comic books and comic strips that people have stopped talking about. We are your hosts, Jordan and Kumar, that's me. And me. And this week we are talking about Fritz the Cat from 1972. Pause the podcast. <laughs> oh, this is a tough one. No, I don't think you need no, to pause the podcast. Absolutely not. I don't think there's. Uh, I guess it's not as a tough one then. We're going to spoil the plot, but I mean, it, what it, it's not the yeah, point. Exactly. It's, it, the you're point. right. It isn't the point. It's not the currency of either of these things. I, I might be jumping the gun here, but did we pause the podcast for heavy metal? Because this film reminds me a bit of heavy metal. Yeah, it certainly does. I don't even know if pause the podcast was a feature at that point in the show, a a segment. Mm. Um, Something I could have looked up before we But it's recording. very much like, um, I don't think he could spoil Blues Brothers. You know what I mean? Sure. Like, if you just describe the plot, yeah, it wouldn't be like... It's not really about the it. plot, is it? Yeah. The no. plot is just a way of getting... A delivery of ice, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so, Fritz the Cat was based on a series of comics by Robert Crumb. Crumb was born in 43, he's now 80 years old. Mm -hmm. He's now living in France. Mm. Um, he used to... I know that he's living in France because because Bakshi will tell you that he's living in France. He has a big problem with the fact that oh, he's living in France. okay. That's but we'll weird. get onto that in a little bit. <laughs> this, 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 this is already weird. <laughs> We're one minute in, I'm like, this is weird. Okay. Uh, he is... He was married to Aline Kaminsky Crumb. She was also a cartoonist in her own right, underground cartoonist. His second wife, actually. Second wife, that's right. Sophie Crumb, their daughter, is also a cartoonist. Uh, he, if you don't know who Crumb is, so he was an underground cartoonist. So mm. these were the underground cartoonist. Yeah, but he wasn't the first. He did come on to the scene, but he became the figurehead, the giant, the biggest seller of them all. Um, so these were comics that were, we're not even talking about, we're talking about underground distribution. Okay, so what's underground means, distribution? Right. This means that at the time, you got a few companies that are printing these up and selling them at head shops, basically. <laughs> or, uh, in Crumb's case, they were selling them out of a baby carriage. <laughs> like, they would print up the comics, and his wife was on the corner of Haight Ashbury in San Francisco selling comics out of a baby carriage. Uh, there's a scene in the American Spider movie where he's selling them out of a trunk of a car. I don't know if that's actually happened or not, uh, but it's quite Surely possible. Surely a baby carriage is more cinematic. <laughs> yes, you think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they these were way off the mainstream. They were basically very... Uh, sur they could be surreal. Just random, just random shit happening. Hmm. Or they could be sexually explicit. Very sexually explicit. Or there could be a lot of drug use. Um, the guy that was really the over-the-top guy was this cartoonist named S. Clay Wilson. So okay. Crumb's stuff was kind of... When he emerged on the scene, he had this weirdly... In the 60s, mid-60s, he had this weirdly nostalgic kind of style. Uh, people would always say... that One of his contemporaries said... I can't remember who it was, said, I couldn't tell if it was an old man who was trying to draw young or a young man that was trying to draw like an mm -hmm. old man. Mm -hmm. He had a style that looked like advertising or poster art from the 20s or the 10s. Like, really old-fashioned looking kind well, that, of stuff. That's his shtick, isn't it? That, that is his shtick, yeah. yeah. He's obsessed with the early 20th century, late 19th century. Especially, well, the music in particular. Mm -hmm. But his drawing style was like that, too. And he was kind of doing this kind of entertainer... He was doing he was doing entertaining comics kind of to a certain extent up until he really encountered S. Clay Wilson's work, which was so over the top. And then he then he started doing the like sexually confessional kind of stuff that he became more famous yeah. for Perfect. through the sixties and seventies. Uh, that was considered kind of his high point. Um, but actually, he had another high point in the eighties. He did uh, he put out a magazine called Weirdo, and he had shorts in there, and that to me is peak. 
crumb. Those are my favorite crumb stories, or the okay. 80s kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, especially that stuff that was in Weirdo. Uh, so, the other key thing we gotta mention in here is that he's drawing in notebooks a lot. He's got a lot of notebook comics which were, were not meant for publication. Right. And he's drawing some finished comics, which he's publishing here and there. So his, his Fritz the Cat stuff was in notebooks originally, right? When yes, from when he Europe? was a little kid. He was drawing Fritz the oh. Cat kind of comics, and then he was still drawing Fritz comics. Well, there he and his brother liked, enjoyed drawing anthropomorphic animals. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. Very much so. There's a key scene in the Robert Crumb documentary where he talks about how he had this... He was sexually attracted to Bugs Bunny dressed as a woman, and he would keep it. He would keep a copy, a drawing of I don't know where it gets strung from a Bugs dressed as a woman in his pocket, and it got a wrinkle. He got his mom to iron it out for him. <laughs> um, I wonder if that inspired that gag in Wayne's World where Garth asks Wayne. Did you ever find Bugs Bunny attractive when he puts on a dress and pretends to be a lady bunny? Yeah, I don't know. Did Wayne's World come out, come out before the Crumb documentary, or that's an interesting question. Yeah, I can't. That only just I feel like it was almost that's the only time, time I've ever heard of anyone being sexually attracted <laughs> to cross-dressing Bugs Bunny. It's Bunny. Garth in Wayne's yeah. World. But it, I it was thinking about Bugs a lot reading these comics this week because Fritz is a bit like Bugs Bunny in that in each episode he's a different character. Like in this one, he's a salesman. Yeah. In the other one, he's a CIA agent. Yeah. Sometimes he's got a guy hanging around in New York. He has certain character traits that are common across his different iterations. Yes. But yes, he'll often have a completely different role, a different job, and sometimes more confident, sometimes less confident, sometimes yes. more knowledgeable, sometimes less knowledgeable. And a big part of it is because, as you said, he's writing them at different times yeah. in his life, isn't yeah. he? Yes. Right. But there's only really six official Fritz the Cat stories between 65 and 69. Okay. Um, and then there was a seventh final official one, which came out in 72, when the movie came out, ah, yes. in which Fritz is killed off. Yes. Which kind of, because... It's called uh, Fritz the Cat Superstar? Yes, that's right. 15 pages? Yes. In which he's pictured as a degenerate movie star, not mm -hmm. a coincidence, who meets his end when a spurned female ostrich pierces his skull with an ice pick. Right. <laughs> right. We'll cover that one when we do The Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat, which is a sequel to this. Uh -huh. mm. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, all right. So we won't necessarily cover that one this week. So the six stories are Fritz Comes on Strong, which is a two, three-page story done for uh, Harvey Kurtzman's magazine Help. Harvey Kurtzman was the mastermind be behind EC's Mad, when it was a comic, and EC's well, right? War oh. Comics. Oh, okay. Um, and then he left Mad, and then he was doing various things, and one of those, he was doing uh, Little Annie Fanny for Playboy, right. and he was doing Help Magazine, which fell apart, unfortunately, for Crumb, because he was getting some work there. So Fritz Cummins on Strong is just a story about um, Fritz gets, just brings this woman back to his apartment, starts stripping her down, and then it seems like they're going to have sex, but then he checks her for fleas. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, he's, yes. Yes, like like a, like grooming. He's grooming her. Yes, like like a like an ape. Yes. So this is a funny little thing where the the animals who have been acting like people suddenly start acting like animals. Yes. At the end. Yeah. Uh, then there was a story called Fred the Teen Girl Pigeon. Uh, this is one where Fritz is some kind of like big like Beatles type superstar, and he gets off a plane, and this teen fan is like going crazy gaga for him. They try to drive away. She launches herself onto the car. She just won't let go. Fritz takes her up to his hotel, and then he's closing the curtains with a sinister look on his face. And well, the it looks like he's about to sleep with this with his groupie, with this teen groupie. But, but she's not. She's but, she's realized. This is not where she wants to be. Too late. Yeah. But instead of being raped, she's eaten. So, yes. <laughs> again, we have that, it, just like the preceding comic, we have that flip at the end where they suddenly start behaving like animals again. Yep. I think it's a, a typical kind of funny, yeah. a, a wry kind of observation that you can often see in Crumb's comics, I think. Yes. Yes. Uh, then there is, uh, the next one was Fritz Bugs Out. So this is a maybe what becomes a more typical Fritz story, even though there's only like six of them. Yes. Which is where it starts out pretty simple, and then things snowball and escalate into this weird, chaotic mess. You're not sure where it's going. It seems like Crumb was probably not writing them, but just going panel to panel, and then figuring out what's going to happen next. 
uh, as he works towards some sort of conclusion, but he didn't have like a plot in mind when well, he started, I'm guessing. I think so. I, uh, I think, as you were saying, that he used to just journal a lot. Yeah. So I think perhaps he wrote Fritz Bugs Out when he was living in Europe, right. doing uh, greeting cards mm -hmm. for a living. Yeah. So he would get a greeting card description in the mail, I assume, or by telegram. Yeah. Uh, he would dash it off, send it back, and get paid something like $25. Yeah. And then he would live, he and his wife at the time... Dana, Dana, yeah, would uh, sort of just live on that. I think she was stealing food as well. I yeah, they were they were on the edge of the poverty line. Yeah, this was a terrible idea. Yeah, but so <laughs> but, and then when he wasn't when he wasn't doing the odd greeting card for this greeting card company back in the states, he was journaling obsessively. Yeah, I guess you could call it journaling. Yeah. He was drawing, writing in this big notebook. Yeah, and one of the things he was writing was Fritz the cat. And I'm I'm not surprised to think that he would be just doing it page by page, yeah. panel by panel, not really thinking hard about where it's going. And as you say, it just it's kind of a situation stacked upon situation. Yeah. Yeah, so in this one, Fritz is on the rebound. He's this his girlfriend, uh, Winst Winston? Was Winston Schultz. Winston Schultz. She's broken up with him. So they go to a party, and he ends up having sex with this girl, Charlene, there. I'm saying girl, but these are all animals, different yep. types of animals. Anthropomorphic animals. So they have human characteristics, fingers, toes. Yeah. So you had a brick... <laughs> yes, so he had, he had a great time with this girl, but then they go back to his apartment, and his roommates are studying for exams, and he gets fed up with the whole system at large. Uh, Western a, culture, at, I don't know what to call it. It's a very um, 60s kind of thing. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. To be a disaffected youth. And I feel like it might have been, his lifestyle might have been a bit like like the people he's hanging around with. Well, you more really than one person sense. has observed that Fritz is Robert Crumb's alter ego. Yeah. A, a more sexually successful, right? More confident, brasher, dashing, like when he's a CIA agent. Yeah, but still fundamentally a naive, right? A, a, an unworldly person. Yes. Who's kind of well? There's a scene in this one obsessed, right? Where he goes to a like a like a jazz bar or something nightclub. And uh, they ask him if he's ever smoked a joint. He's like, uh, no. Like, he's really like nervous about it. So, I mean, if we open a tab here, how would Robert Crumb? How would you describe if oh. you met him? <laughs> if you met him now, it's or really if you met him when he was in it, when he was nineteen years old. God, it's hard to say. He seemed to be very introverted, nervous, yeah. nebbish guy. He seemed to be like your Woody Allen type yes. as a young man. Yes. Then in the 60, late 60s, once he became a kind of underground superstar, women were throwing themselves at him, yep. and he became this nebbish superhero. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like, it's a He's... very strange thing. Um, if you ever get a chance to watch a documentary... Well, we might cover it. It's on the yeah, checklist. Yeah, it's, um, some of it's been massaged a bit by Terry Zweigoff and directing it. He was like, okay, Absolutely. draw. We're doing this interview. Why don't you do some drawing? Why? This kind of stuff. And yeah. apparently him and you know, I, Aline were both like trying to egg him on to be more um, curmudgeonly yeah, in the course. movie than he actually is. Yeah. And stuff like that. But anyway, so, um, there's scenes there. He's doing a photo shoot for a magazine. So he has this sexual fetish about women with giant tree trunk legs yeah. and huge butts and, husky, and piggybacking. Husky ladies. If if you don't know who Robert Crumb is, and you're listening to this, you, you probably know him as that one cartoonist that really likes husky chips. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but there's a scene in the movie where some magazine sets up a photo shoot for him with women that are built exactly like this, and he, and he piggybacks around on them. So this guy's like living out his... Fantasies. His fantasies, yeah. his fetishes. He was able to through his fame. Yeah. Uh... You won't be surprised to hear that Ralph Bakshi has a lot to say about that okay. documentary. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah. So Fritz in this, so he's he's he kind of he so he's pissed off with this whole exam system, whatever. He sets fire to his place. Yeah. He runs away. He is wanted by the cops. I think he does because this, he's is this a big speech on the street in this one, or is that a different story where he gets on a soapbox almost literally and starts talking about taking down them? I think that's a late, the other story. They get a bit mixed up, sorry, but because there's cops no, show think, up in three, two or three of them. Yeah, they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Cops are always showing up, which I think is probably again another thing that probably was happening to him and his buddies when they were hanging around. Um, I don't know. So he, yeah, he's on the run, uh, and Winston finds him. He's hiding in a garbage can in an alley, and they decide to go on a road trip. So he has this wanderlust. They want to go see the country, but the car breaks down on the way. Mm. 
he says he can fix it. He's talking out of his ass. He just talks a lot of nonsense about he does. the the what does he the say? Carburetor the carburetor. He says he says the carburetor rusted up, which could happen. But then he says something like a piston got stuck in the drive shaft. Yeah. Which is just, yeah. Like, yeah. I don't really know much about cars, but I know that that sort of thing that happens because yeah. they're in completely different parts. Of the yeah. So he ends up riding the rails. He says, I'm going to live the life. And he's like enjoying it, but then he gets Well, caught. he abandons Winston. He leaves yes, her he in leaves a, her, that's right. Well, this, the, it's actually, I, I like this. I don't, I don't really love these comics. Hmm. I don't, I'm not sure I like Crom, but... Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like this page because uh, a, a bloke pulls up like a, like a redneck. Yeah, and like a pickup with a... Like a rube yeah. in, a, in a pickup. And... Um, uh, they uh, Fritz is like, oh, you know, we our car's broken down. There's a problem with the engine. Uh, can you give us a push to the nearest gas station? And the the Rube gets out and says like, oh, look, I know a bit about engines. I sure could fix that, maybe. And Winston, both Winston and Fritz, like, are sneering at him. Yeah. But look at this, you know, look at this hillbilly. Yeah. What's this guy going to know about cars that we... You know, hippies from you know, it, it's a it's a, it's very nice, a neat skewering of the kind of bourgeois mm. nature of hippies. Mm. The, they're all you know, they're all inner city types that think they're better than other people, and that and I think Crum is kind of expertly skewering them here. But of course, the joke's on them because the quote unquote rube immediately sees that they just haven't put water in the radiator, yeah. and then they're crestfallen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, whoops. Yeah. This guy knows... An ordinary person might know more about cars than you. Yeah, yeah. So Fritz has to go up the road with a bucket to get some water, but he just gets fed up yep. halfway up the road. He throws the bucket. He decides, I'm going to ride he's, the rails by himself. very self-centered. Very yep. self-obsessed. He gets on a he gets on a train. He's going from place to place. Finally gets caught and thrown out. And he wanders around. He's like, what city is this? And then he's chased by some people and then he just ends up stumbling back into his own apartment yep. where he began. That's right, right where he started. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the next story was... It's a bit like the hero's journey. He ends up right back where he started. <laughs> so it's a bit of an odyssey, actually. Fritz bugs out. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Fritz is no good is also another one that's all over the place. Starts out this time, Fritz is a deadbeat. He's... He's... On unemployment, he refuses to go to the unemployment office meetings yep. or go to the interviews that they set up for him. He has, he's, he's married. Yeah, he has he's, a son. Yes, and they're, they're shooting up. No, not are they shooting up? But they're doing drugs anyway. Yeah. maybe just weed. But it's not a great environment. For no, a child. it's not great for anybody. Uh, but he's really bad to his wife. Yeah. Uh, but we learned this is the same Fritz from Fritz Bugs Out because he his ex girlfriend is Winston. Winston she yeah. shows up in this one. He goes and gloms on her. Starts mooching off her. He's mooching off everybody in this. Yes. He's like, he has no shame. He'll just borrow money off a poor person. Yeah. Change for the phone, change for the bus, so that he can call up someone else that he can mooch off so he can catch the bus to where someone else is that he can mooch off them. And he ends up falling in with... These revolutionaries. Yes. This uh, cell. Again, very bourgeois. Yeah. Very 60s, you know, elitist types talking Marxist jargon. Yeah, intellectual hippies. Intellectual yeah. hippies, perfect. Uh, he ends up signing up to blow up a power plant. Or a bridge? Was it a bridge? They what? had to cross the bridge. They, gotta, they, they end up stuck on, on bridge. the bridge. Yeah. yeah, they're stuck on the bridge. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. he's he's arrested. Yes. Uh, ends up in jail. Ends up in jail. And then his wife does come to visit him in jail, but then we cut to a panel, which is two months later. He's out of jail and he's on the street. He's, she's kicking him out money. again. Yeah. Just she's like at the start of the comic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, now we have another story, which is starts out with Fritz in the park uh, with a guitar, with his friends, looking to play some music, pick up some chicks with music, but the yeah. park is packed with people. Um, this is what you did. I, I read an interview with Ralph Bakshi. He says that uh, in the 50s, you drove around in a car. In the 60s, you hung out in the park with a guitar. Yeah. Yeah. That's how you picked up chicks. Yeah. Um, and he does successfully, he, he pretends he's really, like, depressed. <laughs> having, he pretends he's having an existential crisis. These girls yeah. are sorry for him. These three girls, they go back to yeah. his apartment. The only room they can have access to is a bathroom. Well, they're, they're utterly enamored with his shtick. Yeah. This, this, because they're all self-obsessed hippie types. Yeah. And the fact that he's claiming to be in intellectual torment because there's nothing of life left to experience. They all want to alleviate his... Suffering. Yes. They all want to be a part of his spiritual journey. So it's all very navel-gazing, self-obsessed. They go back, as you said, to the apartment that 
is it it might be his apartment it might be just uh, i think they're all living there together it might just be a head I'm not sure space either. it might people are just in there getting high Ron guys reading the dictionary <laughs> in this scene like just in order reading all the words in order out of the dictionary Amazing. Uh, the bathroom's the only room available, so they go into the bathroom, they sit in the bathtub, and they essentially start having... They start having sex in the bathtub. Yep, an orgy. Then the other guys this is in the apartments are coming in, and they all start really piling into the bathtub at the same time. Crumb By the way, it's all done in a nine-panel grid. Yeah, nine-panel grid. And all the same perspective. Because yeah. Crumb doesn't change perspective much, I've noticed, that when he's... Not uh, in these comics, cartoons. yeah. And it actually, it, it's hilarious here, because we get nine panels of essentially the same perspective, like a painting. Yeah, <laughs> yes. and more and more figures crowd in. Yeah. It gets more and more yeah. frenetic. Yeah, more and more weird stuffs going on. People are disrobing. They're all anthropomorphic yeah. animals. You don't see any genitals, but there's quite a few breasts and buttocks. Yes, yeah, so actually, tw it's twelve panels actually. Oh We're right, okay. Pages now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're, they're all the same perspective, right? They're all just looking at the bathtub head on. Yeah, yeah. It's great. So then the cops bust up this party. Uh, cops are bears. Were they bears in this? They're bears in the comic. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Fritz goes on the run and he ends up at this, uh, bar where he kind of, he kind of gives a sob story to this crow. The crows are blacks in yeah. this world, well, in black, this animal well, world. Well, blacks are crows. Blacks are crows, yes. So, uh, every other race can be any, uh, well, I say any other, every other race. White people can be, white characters can be any animal. Yes. But if you're black, you're a crow. Right. Okay, so this is the one where he meets the crows. I th am I getting this right? Am I getting things all confused? <laughs> it's, it, well, it's yes. easy to get them all confused because yes. they're all essentially the same. Yes. So, yeah, this is the one where he goes... Okay, so he goes to the, he meets the crow. They go to a party. This is where he's given pot. Right. He has sex with the lady at the party, and yep. then suddenly he has a light bulb moment. Yeah, that's when, he starts, oh, that's when he starts ranting. That's right. when he gets on the soapbox yes. in the neighborhood, and he's yes. like, us cats are your oppressors. Uh, you need to rise up, have a revolution. The cops show up. He's like, those are the tools of, those are like the instruments of the oppressors. Yep. They start beating up the cop. Uh, Fritz goes home, and all the women he's met over the course of the day, uh, like I think the some of the girls from the bathtub and yep. the girl he had sex with from the jazz club, yep. um, all show up. The cops show up again. So he runs. Now he's hiding in the alley in the garbage can. Winston Fine. Oh my god, I've, no, I've got this confused. It's alright. <laughs> this is so bizarre. Okay, I'm trying it's to okay. remember which they one. They all start to blur together, and they do that in the film as well, so yeah. it's fine. So, I mean, what are the common elements of all these Fritz the Cat comics, essentially? Uh, it's a satire, I think, mostly of, of, of late 60s youth, so that yeah. kind of self-obsessed, very pompous, layered with political dialogue, but essentially very bourgeois. Yeah. Kind of... Oh. I figured it out. Oh, sorry. Okay. Keep going. No, 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 no. I'm, I was. So this, this is <laughs> this story is, is six panels a page, but when when the cops bust in on this one, he runs out and he meets a guy, a rich guy wearing a top hat, and he steals his money or something, and then he shows up in a top hat and he, he comes to the park. All his clothes. He comes to the park the next day and everybody's in a top hat yeah. and a waistcoat. Yeah. And that's how it ends. Yes, yeah. that's that's why it's confusing me because that yeah. one just kind of ends when the cops show up. The shallowness. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're talking about the satire of like American youth culture at the time. There's a, there's a CIA story which is the last one, um, where he's a CIA agent. Yeah. And he goes to China on this mission. Yeah, it's a bit. It's this one's. It's a bit dodgy. It's a bit They're all dodgy. <laughs> one where <laughs> this one's I, we didn't mention dodgy. the one where he joins the revolutionaries. Uh, one of them is this well, he, he, guy on a motorbike with this horse that his girlfriend is a horse, and Harry, they tie her the up horse. and uh, assault her in all sorts of ways. Well, um, Fritz rapes her, essentially. Yeah, I think they all do. Well, Fritz first. Fritz initiates yeah. it. Yeah. So they, yeah, it's pretty unsavory. Now, here's what I'll say two things about this. Uh, this is, well, Crumb's famous for this. Sorry. He's, fr he's famous for this. He's case. famous for this stuff. He's famous for, quote unquote, misogyny. Yes. But he will always tell you it's lines on paper. Yeah, it's his fantasies. It's, uh, his, it's his, And if you watch the Crumb documentary, I mean, his brother killed himself in the course of making it, and it's clear that the drawing was the only thing that was keeping these guys sane. Right. And this is his outlet. Yes. And it's... It's a strange situation because you read interviews with Aline or Sophie and there, there's no sense of no. this guy being 
a gross creep or anything like that. It's in the, I mean, the work, if you read the work, it's absolutely there. Yeah. I think the other component of this is that... Yeah, there's a lot of violence against women, a lot of sexual assault. Yeah, but we've talked about the, um, the satire, and I think part of the problem is that Crumb is not a great satirist. Uh, right. I think sometimes it works and sometimes it's... Well, it's hard to tell what satire because the and what CIA, isn't. Yeah, well, the CIA one, I'd say, is a, he's trying to do a satire of the racist perception of China by Americans. Now... I'm not sure I, he is, though. Right? This, exactly. Yeah. I think you're, the fact that you're not sure he is, is, the point is I think his satire has kind of fallen on its butt. Yeah, for real. Sometimes. When you, I think he's either... Yeah, it's hard to say. I think sometimes he's very cool, very sharp, Mm -hmm. in his satire and sometimes it's like a bludgeon yeah and yeah. it almost feels like sometimes it's deliberate and sometimes it's his own right uh perceptions mm. his own upbringing i mean he's 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 gone on the record as saying some of his earlier work you know when he has especially kind of very there's only racist stuff particularly against black people yeah like he has a character angel food angel, angel cake angel, McSpade? angel cake mcspade or something like that looks I can't, I can't believe I can't remember her name. And, Angel, yeah, yeah. Anyway. And his main excuse for that is this is the milieu in which I grew up. You know, I was born in. Yes, and he's drawing the kind of stuff from the tens and twenties that. So, yeah. So sometimes the satire is he's clear. It's clearly coming from something that he sees as worthy of satire, and he wants to satirize it. And then sometimes it's just he's just expressing himself as a person born in the forties. Mm. And the one is artistically interesting, and yeah. the other is. Less so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all baked in here. Absolutely. Um, it's, I mean, but this is before his, you know, sexual awakening period, let's call it. Well, he the, drops acid, right, in the late 60s. Yes. And that changes the nature of his work, for sure. And then, as I mentioned, the being exposed to the work of S. Clay Wilson really made him, okay, I'm going to do sexually explicit comics. Because mm. these aren't really explicit. Um, like you said, we see animal breasts, we never see Felix's penis. No, there's Felix no genitals. Fritz. Fritz. Fritz Felix the cat was a different cat. <laughs> that's not the last time that's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 100% sure of it. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, but, I mean, his work is so sexually charged. Yes. Because so much of his own sexual fetishes Oh, yeah, and even, even if this isn't that later period... He, he can't help it coming out on the page. He can't help it. There's these meaty... You just always know when you're looking at a Crumb yeah. comic. I mean, he has a very distinctive style. Anyone who sees it will recognise it mm. immediately. But in case you're wondering what's a Crumb comic, just look for the ones where the chicks have... Uh, the, the, everyone's got enormous buttocks. Yes. <laughs> and tree trunk and thighs. legs. Tree trunk thighs, yeah. 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 Very, very specific type. Uh, okay, so, yeah, and then there's the CIA one, which we mentioned is he goes to China. We don't really have to go into that one too much. It's just, not covered in the movie. Just that he's, uh, yeah, it's not covered in the movie, so we don't need to talk about it much. Just but it is the, that the Bugs Bunny interest. thing where he's just another character. He's like a different character. Yeah, Fritz there's Scott no reason playing a different for him role. to be yeah. a CIA agent. But again, he, and, and women women are throwing themselves at him. He's That's a very specific parody of the James Bond movies. Yes, but women are always throwing themselves at Fritz. Yes. And again, this is... Uh, Crumb's, I suppose, Crumb, as you say, he's a very... He's a dork, yeah. right? Yeah. He's like the saint of dorks. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so at this point, his alter ego is enormously popular mm. with the ladies. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so most of these stories are reprinted in complete Crumb number three, in case... Mm -hmm. you... So, and all the other all the other Fritz stories you see, which were printed later, were not drawn for publication. They came out of the sketchbooks. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but they, they do show up, like, especially Complete Crumb number one has uh, a lot of the sketchbook works, and they're published here and there in other places, too. Uh, I guess we can move on to the movie. Let's do so. All right, and talk about... But first, before we talk about the film specifically, let's talk about Ralph Bakshi. Okay. I'll let you... Would you like to... Well, I don't have much to say about Bakshi. Bakshi was an animator who his, did early work on Mighty Mouse and the Spider-Man cartoon from the 60s, which yep. everybody knows. He's um, not a comics artist or a cartoonist. Yep. He's, he, but he's in the related he's field an of animation. Right. He was an animator. Fritz the Cat was his first movie, mm -hmm. his first feature film, because he'd worked on TV cartoons, like your Saturday morning stuff, 
for years. 72, I don't know what the story is. I'm sure you've got the story of how he decided to make a feature film. I do. Which is way off Mighty Mouse, as far as you can get. And then he's got a list of about 10 movies between 72 and 92, Fritz the Cat, Heavy Traffic. So probably if you're, you've probably seen the covers for all of these things or heard about them. Yeah. I've probably seen half of these, right. not all of them. I don't know if there are any real Bakshi heads out. I'm sure they're out there that are huge fans of his work. Um, I find, I, I love that he's trying, yeah. is I what I can say. that seems to be the consensus, really. Um, but his, it's, his, it's, his it's, it's like he's making the same being... mistakes every movie. It's like, <laughs> this scene is going on too long. These characters need to be talking. You know, there's a weird kind of staging. Not just that, but it's his films are always look so cheap. They he's do. He's famous for being, like, really cheap. Well, I mean, he, he always had a low budget with every yeah, film that he was Yeah, making. and yet he was making, trying, he kept trying, and he kept making them the same style. I think the low budget, later on he goes into the rotoscoping style, which looks really cool, like yeah. the well, he, he did Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Lord of the Rings. He did a Lord of the Rings yep. cartoon. Yeah. Which was the kind of like visual representation of Lord of the Rings until Peter Jackson made his trilogy yes. in the early 21st century. Yep. And Ralph Bakshi has stuff to say about that as well. Uh, but so, I mean, he and he did Cool World cool with Brad Pitt. With 92, it was the last feature as far as I can tell. Yep. He hasn't made a movie since, it was a big failure. That was a big failure. Fire and Ice was 83, that was 10 years before Cool World. That's a pretty... Fire and Ice, uh, Frank Frazetta. Frank Frazetta designs and written by, I think, Jerry two, Conway. Two and, Conan writers, right. Yeah, yeah, some comic book as writers. As soon as I saw that, I stuck it on the cheat list. So. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was on there yeah. already, but yeah, it's, oh, yeah. um, yeah. I've seen that. It should be awesome. Right. It's really pretty dull. He's a, it, a lot he's of a time. trier. He's a tri yeah. He's such a try. People keep throwing money at him to do these things. There's well, a bunch I haven't seen. It's been a while since 90. Yeah, Coonskin, uh, Wizards, haven't seen Lord of the Rings we mentioned. Wiz American yeah. Pop. A lot of people are exposed to Ralph Bakshi when their parents rented a cartoon from the video store thinking it was for kids. Right. And then you find out it's not for kids. Mm. That was how I was exposed to Ralph Bakshi, through Wizards. Well, in fact, like, Fritz is rated X. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. Well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. But um, it's worth mentioning just briefly before we move on that uh, Bakshi and Crumb hate one another. Yep, I believe it. With a deep and abiding hatred. Yeah. Ever since 19, you know, 72. 72. Yeah. Ever since 1972. Yeah. Well, that's why Crumb killed the character after the movie that came is, out. That's correct. Which is a odd response because it doesn't really affect... It, I guess it's his own, it's for his own peace of mind because there's still the sequel that comes out, you know, a few years later. Well, and which Bakshi had nothing to do yeah. with, and nor did the other kind of creative force behind the the film, uh, Steve Krantz, the producer okay. for the film. That neither of them had anything to do right. with the sequel. I'm honestly not quite sure how it got made, but I don't know anything. Well, about I'm sure it. the studio. Well, the studio. okay, so first of all, right. how did this one get made? Well, Crumb was not sure about selling the rights to oh, Bakshi well, in the first place. Uh, but that's a whole story. I, I can't wait to get into that. Yeah. But to, to wind it back a little bit, Ralph Bakshi is interesting because, and Robert Crumb are interesting because you couldn't get two more different people. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. They are enormously so different. So, are you saying Bakshi is like a jock, ba Hollywood Bakshi, cigar chomping type, or what do you think? Not like that. Okay. But he's, he's like a... Jack Kirby type. Okay. So okay, very extroverted. Extroverted is the word. Right. Grew up in New York. Okay. Like 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 Kirby did. Yeah. You hear Bakshi describing his youth. It's like that Kirby comic. Mm. You know the one we've shared it on yes. the Facebook page. Um, Street Code. Street Code. Mm. It's just like that. Uh, enormously extroverted. Enormously passionate. Mm. He seems to be. Uh, capable of browbeating. So you're wondering where the mystery of where his funding comes from. He seems to be. An enormously successful salesman of okay. his own passions. Got it. You're in a room with Bakshi, and you're being bludgeoned by his personality, apparently. That seems to be the secret of how he gets his movies made. Yeah. Couldn't be more different from Crumb, who, as you said, is introverted. Yeah. Nerdy. Yeah. Uh, sexually repressed. Bakshi doesn't sound sexually repressed. He's giving interviews in his 80s talking about laying people in the animating <laughs> studio. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Just, it's so funny that these two very, very different people, well, they didn't collaborate mm. per se, but they ended up tied together in this film. And of course, have earned one another's undying mm. enmity. Well, it's interesting, the credit 
we get here is characters created by Robert Crumb. It doesn't say based on the comics by Robert Crumb or anything like that. No. And it just says characters created by, but there's a lot of dialogue here, which is lifted word for word, word, for word. from Crumb's comics. Okay, so we start with a still shot of New York City. We're told it's the 1960s, uh, and it zooms into the still. So it's very cheap from your opening oh, yeah. second. So it explains the zooms just, into the still. It, yeah, the camera just goes left or right around the still. Instead of animating somebody walking through the city or something like that, just a picture of the city, and then the camera will look at one part of it or zoom in And closer. it gets blurrier. Yeah. Because we're not getting a new drawing. No. <laughs> we're just getting the same drawing. This is like, this film's made on a shoestring budget. <laughs> oh, yeah. This happens over and over and over. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the establishing shots in this movie are long. This is not the first time it happens, but there's another one where there's a whole song. Like, this crow sings a song as we go into a slow zoom onto the city, as if we're looking at something really awesome. And it's just a way to drag out an extra minute out of this hour and 18 minute movie. It's, <laughs> it's not a long movie. No. Um, so then we get some construction workers who are, you know, blue collar construction workers talking about, one's talking about his hippie daughter who's come home uh, from college and she's shacked up with some guy and she has all these hippie ideas, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, this is, um, these are real people. Yes. So what? I believed it. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's hard, It's not hard to believe it because the audio quality is so poor. Right, yes. <laughs> so what um, Bakshi, very passionate guy, Bakshi, he's passionate about his art. Mm -hmm. What he would do was he would go around and uh, record people, essentially. He would take a recorder around, he would go to, say, like Harlem, go into bars, mm -hmm. drink with people... Uh, buy them drinks, get drunk, and essentially record, record them. them. Okay. And this forms a, quite a bit of, if not the dialogue, but the background noise that's going on throughout the film. Okay, I did wonder about that. Maybe we'll talk about those scenes when we get to them, but they're very long scenes of people yeah. just chattering. Yes. And it sounds really authentic, and it doesn't... I'm like, how did he get people into a studio to re read this off a script, and it's not... No, it they didn't. Yeah. They, there are only four credited voice actors. I'm sure you noticed right. in the final credits... Because so much of the dialogue is just recorded in public with people, okay. non-actors. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Would, they were real people. These construction workers actually found them, yeah. paid them fifty bucks each. Yeah, pretty good in yeah. seventy-two dollars. Opened a bottle of scotch, drank scotch with them, mm. and just recorded their recorded conversation. The conversation. I've got a quote from Bakshi. He said, "What I did was." Went out into the street and asked a couple of construction workers if they'd come up to my office. I paid them 50 bucks each. I had a bottle of scotch and I had this reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder. I asked them what was bothering them, what they were unhappy about, and all this stuff came out and we had a great mm. time. There was hours of this stuff. I wanted Fritz the Cat to feel real and it felt like I had to do this in order to believe the material. So I recorded all kinds of things on that tape recorder, like street noises, to make it feel realistic. Huh. Okay, I guess it... It does seem like realistic dialogue, because of course it's real dialogue, but it's the sound quality is so bad. It's so weird that he doesn't care about sound. I understand he he's thinking visually. It, everything's just done on the cheek. He doesn't, and it's the same thing with the animation. Like the animation is pretty crappy. Oh yeah. In this, it reminded me of I couldn't believe how cheap it was for a feature film. Yeah. Because it looked like Fat Albert or something yeah. like that. It looked like a Saturday morning filmation cartoon. You know, because it's all done on the because they have no money, it's all yeah. done on the cheap, and Bakshi just doesn't care. What he cares about is the quote, I guess, the message or the yes, or the quote unquote the feel, art. something about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the feel, not the the technical proficiency. Yeah, uh, it, it has to do with, I suppose, I read in a, there's a very long article online that was originally published in a fanzine or magazine called Funny World, mm -hmm. you might have heard of it by someone called Michael Barrier, still active, still maintains his website. Uh, and his he writes that Disney bestrode as the animation landscape like a colossus mm -hmm. at this time, as arguably it, it, it still does up yeah. to the present yeah. for different reasons. But the only animation was Disney animation. And it was all for children, mm -hmm. and it was all technically flawless, yeah. but 
kind of artistically dead. Yeah, I think even more dead at this point in time because we've come out of the golden age of yes. Snow White, that rotoscoping area, and we're now into probably like the Robin Hood kind of era. What was going on in the 70s? Like things like the Dark Cauldron or crap like Black that? Black Cauldron, that was 80s Black even. Cauldron. But yeah, but okay. yeah, we're kind of before Little Mermaid right. brings oh, it yeah, back. Before the Renaissance. We're kind of the, the, yeah. Yeah, but so, you know, and the idea is that here, back, back she is kind of like anti-Disney. Right. He's the, he's right. the anti-Disney. Okay, This now it makes sense that he beelines, or makes a straight line for Fritz the Cat in 72. He's like, this is, I can make an anti-Disney yeah. movie out of yes. it. Yes, yes. Right. Exactly. Right. But uh, speaking of the terrible sound quality, that quote I read earlier continues on. When I went to have the film mixed, the sound engineers gave me all kinds of crap about the tracks not being professionally recorded. It's got it. Imagine me with a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even want to mix the noise of bottles breaking in the background, street noise, tape hiss, all kinds of shit. They said it was unprofessional, but I didn't care. They said you have to re-record this in a studio, and I said, over my dead body, mm. it's going in the mix. Okay. Well, yeah, you got these two, construction workers up on a... They're working on a high rise. But it's great dialogue because it's, it's great dialogue, but it sounds like they're recording in can... a tin can. <laughs> Not they don't, right. they don't sound like they're outdoors at all. One of the guys after gets up and takes a leak and oh, yeah, this is interesting. There's a lot... so there's a lot of peeing in this movie, yeah. and this one the the urine forms the opening credits. Yeah. Like it's there as like sparkles in the it's background. It's scatological. Bizarre. Bizarre. <laughs> okay, so. After this, after the credits, we cut to the park, and we've got Fritz and his pals in the park with their guitars. By the way, some <clears throat> characters are walking by, human-type characters, in the keep on trucking pose. Robert Crumb's keep on trucking with the <laughs> arms and legs yeah. way out. Yeah. Um, yes, so that'll be a nod. There's, there are some nods. Uh, Angel Food McSpade. She also, shows up in there, yeah. Show she does show up. So there, there are definite nods to his stuff. Yes, yeah. They're in the park with their guitars. They're trying to pick up chicks again. Lift, they talk the about the he lifted from the from the lifted comic. a lot of it exactly. They talk about it being too crowded, but then when we cut to the close-up shot, there's nobody else in the park <laughs> for the rest of the scene. I was like, that's bizarre. So they're hoping to hook up with these chicks, but these chicks are hanging out with this crow. Yeah, we know the crows stand for blacks. Yeah, here. Uh, or represent and them. And this is fine. They they deliver all this. Um, oh, light. it's I would. They are. They are like woke seventy two. I think is they think so they woke. understand the black condition. Yeah. They're talking to him as if they understand what it's like to be. They just say all this stuff. Yeah. And it's like straight out of. They're all obviously in the first year of uni yes. or college as the <laughs> Americans would say. Yeah. And they're just saying all this stuff that they've picked up, and it, there's just no depth to it whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, why doesn't why does James L. Jones only play black roles? Yes, right. yes. <laughs> one line. Yeah, very funny line. <laughs> Long before he played Darth Vader. Yeah, uh, he'd been in the Great White Hope around this time. I think he'd been nominated for an Oscar for that movie. And one of the characters even says that uh, something about blacks and Jews being the closest. Oh yeah, yeah. There's something like ethnicities that. Ethnicities in terms of their suffering, and so they get it. And then, uh, and then it turns out the black. The um the crow is gay. Right. <laughs> he says, "What does he say?" He, he he he's very camp. He says something like, "I ain't no jive ass punk." Something like that. Uh, Who do you think I am, Geraldine? I had to Google Geraldine. Yes. Geraldine was a character that a black comic used to play in drag at this time. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And um, originated apparently some common expressions that are still with us today, like when you're hot, you're hot, and when you're not, you're not. Right. And the devil made me do it. Right. Okay. So that was all Geraldine. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Uh, so yeah, he leaves. All that dialogue, by the way, is not from the comic. Most of that. No. That in, in that the comic. Um, in the co in the comic, arguably, it's worse. Because Fritz gets rid of him by telling him they're selling weed for a dime yeah, or something. something like that. For a and nickel. He, for a nickel, that's it. And he just takes off. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. But here, he's of a different persuasion and he's not interested yes. in the ladies because he's gay. Or or possibly he just... He's not impressed by their yeah. That's what I, that was. I thought. Well, well he I might be pretending be to both. be. He yeah. might he might be pretending to be uh, uninterested because he's not impressed with their shallow political yes. discourse. Yes. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. And then Fritz shows up and does the same thing as the comic. He starts posturing, talking about his torment. Yeah. His existential woe. Yeah. And they're all immediately enthralled with it, of course, because they're idiots. Yep. 
Um, and here it pretty much plays out much like the comic. Yes, but in the comic, none of these girls is Winston, but they've changed one of them to <laughs> Winston in the movie just to tie things so together. It's so, so, it's so, it's so dodgy. <laughs> yeah. It's so cheap. Yeah. Right, so what happens is later in the film, Winston shows up, and at some point, someone, Bakshi presumably, has realised that, oh shit, Winston shows up later in the film and from nowhere. There's yeah. no introduction to who this character is. Ah, uh, let's just shove in some dialogue earlier, but he's having an orgy with a completely different character, and w she'll be Winston. Yeah. But it's a different character. They don't look at all oh, the same. right, okay. Yep. And they don't act at all the same. Yep. Because the Winston later in the film is quite... Uh, shrewish. Why would the Winston later in the film come looking for him yeah. when not the other two girls didn't? Yeah, it's just the absolute like shoestring yeah, nature yeah, yeah. of this production. Yeah. yeah. So they go back. They have it plays out much like the comic, except you don't have the guy reading the dictionary. Unfortunately, no. they. It's not as funny as well because we don't have the single perspective where more and more figures crowd in. No, it's and played it's, straight. And it's way more sexually explicit yes. than the comic was, well, strangely. This is what the movie's famous for. Yeah. Uh, for being a... Graphic. Graphic. Or, pornographic might be overstating it, but certainly graphic. Yeah. A graphic, a sexually graphic cartoon yes. at a time when only Disney was making cartoons. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And I think this is probably around the period that pornography is playing in cinemas, in movie theaters. So the X rating, yes, it is. So we can get this. There's some this overlap. Movie can be made. Yes. So this this film was promoted. Like you can see posters or where the tagline is. There's a reason we're rated X. Yeah. And things like that. Yeah. So it's a selling point. The X rating, which originally was just meant for adults. Yes, that's right. It, it commonly associated with art house films. Right? Yeah. Uh, was starting at this point at, to be associated with what we associate it with, right. which is sex, pornography, essentially. But um, not not quite all the way there, but enough that promotional yes, material... you're right, but the, the movie's got, it's got all, lots of swearing, which is, I mean, in the comic, but a lot of drug use, a lot of needles. Yeah. In fact, just randomly, there's a scene at one point where Fritz is running through an alley and a woman in a window, like her top falls off. Hmm. So we see her cartoon animal breasts as if we should care. But then a guy pops out of a garbage can, shoots himself with a needle, goes a bit crazy and goes back in the garbage can. I'm like, why is this... What why? is... It's just... It's being... It's really edgelord kind of stuff. Yeah, like we're going to show a guy using a needle. And this is a crow too. So we, it's this is in Harlem. Right. It's a black guy. Yeah. But lots of other cats. Yeah. Lots of animals shoot up, not just the crows. Yes. So, oh, I gotta say this bathtub scene, so, as I mentioned, it's more explicit, like, we see Fritz, like, licking her breasts in a really, like, prolonged shot. There's very little that's different, well, there's some differences, so Fritz's tail goes around in a loopy kind that's of way, cool. in an animation way. That's cool. And when some of the other people come in and they start doing drugs in the bathroom, which happens in the comic, one of these girls starts, like, floating in the air as she gets high, Fritz which is not too. something. Like, yeah, he, he does too. as well. Um, so we're seeing some some extent to use the yeah, animation yes uh, in a in a way that beyond just putting what's in the comic on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, now the cops show up. Now I want to know what you thought is cops based on our discussion about Nikki Larson and the extraneous characters that just would not leave the screen. <laughs> <laughs> These cops. So in the comic, it's. You are kind of in the life of the hippies in these apartments, and then the cops bust in. Yeah. In the movie, cops aren't characters. Here we see the cops on the street. Yeah. Before they are anywhere even. And near they're like, the "We're going to raid this place." They have super dumb voices, like from heavy metal. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, there, there's, there's like quote unquote jokes uh, where they're like talking about the raid, etc. What they're going to do in there. Yeah. What you should say when you knock filler. on the door. And uh, well. There might be an answer here. Guess who voices one of the cops? It's a Bakshi? It is. Okay. He voices the one, hilariously, he voices the one that's not called Ralph. Because hmm. <laughs> Bakshi's name is Ralph. <laughs> it's Ralph Bakshi. <laughs> he, he voices the nameless cop, the one with the really stupid voice. Okay. Okay. Um, one is a rookie and one is supposed to be 
like yeah. the veteran, but they, they kind of interchange. But they switch roles. They switch. It doesn't make any yeah, sense. At one point, the sense. rookie is telling the veteran how to knock on the door. Yeah, it's stupid. I think I couldn't figure out what was going on. And these scenes are long yeah, and unfunny. Really long. And, and this is an hour and 20 minute film. This isn't a long film. No. And these uh, these characters are in a lot Bumbling of Bumbling cops time. are... They come up, uh, they appear again and again. Yeah. They get a lot of screen time. Yeah. They're pigs, by the way. Yeah. Um, Not bears, like in the comic. Right. They're pigs. Yeah. Uh, like, I get it. Yeah. I get it, yeah. Ralph. Yeah. They, there's a lot of talk with the cops show up. They bust up the party, as in the comic. Um... The somebody pisses on the cop again. again. Another another. Why we got this pee scene? Why have we got peeing? One of the cops starts having sex with one of the girls there. Um, now Fritz goes on the run. Okay, so here's now where we're mixing up the three. Well, Fritz, Fritz comics. Fritz, well, first thing he does is he, like in the comic, he pinches the cop's gun. Yeah, and shoots the toilet. Shoots the toilet, and then it it floods the flat, and everybody leaves. And then we get a hard cut to a synagogue. This is a really odd scene. Yes, because it's nowhere in the comics. It's like, what is a synagogue scene? And these rabbis, one of them has forgotten his glasses or doesn't have glasses. I can explain this. Um, and it just went on forever. Yeah. Again, here, this is more... Um, this is more Bakshi stuff. Yeah. Uh, Bakshi's Jewish. Okay. Uh, his neighborhood, when he was growing up, was like 90% Jewish. Okay. So this is the New York of his childhood here, essentially. Okay. The three rabbis... They are Bakshi's own father and uncles. <laughs> okay. In archival okay uh, recordings, so recordings that had been made earlier. So he's just put it in. This this scene it doesn't serve any purpose, any narrative. Purpose no, whatsoever. finally, finally, like after that. several minutes, it's revealed that Fritz is hiding in the beard. He's hiding of one of, their one of the rabbis. They're all identical. Like there's no. They they all look identical. So there's about. 40 rabbis? Yeah. Well, that's a lot of rabbis. And they're all they're, they're all just lined up in the synagogue. They're all sitting in what would be in a church would be pews. And they're all just reading the Torah. you got three up the front who have got this shtick about not having worn their glasses. And this is just, as I said, this is just stuff that Bakshi had recorded yeah. of his family. Yeah. Uh, and Fritz is hidden in here. And then the cops come in and we get, again an endless scene where the cops are kind of bickering because the nameless cop voiced by Bakshi is Jewish, of course, because Bakshi is, mm -hmm. and he's talking about how these are his people, we've mm -hmm. got to be polite, mm -hmm. you know, you can't, you know, you can't be rude to these people because they're my people, you shouldn't even be here in the... Like, the other cop doesn't know what a synagogue is, mm -hmm. he thinks it's a cult. <laughs> <laughs> is this a church or something when he walks yeah. in at first? He doesn't really know what's going on. It all just goes on really long... I mean, then there's film... a, but then there's a radio. They listen to the radio news, and there's a report that um, Golda Meir has has gotten back Israel in trade for New York and LA. It's really odd. It seems like a really Zionist plot kind of joke. Yeah. Uh, and then all the rabbis cheer and celebrate. And I was like, what? I was before you revealed to me now, just now that Bakshi was Jewish. I was like, this is kind of worse than anything in the CIA comic. <laughs> no, it's. It's just some sort of in Yiddish in joke, right? Or, or Jewish in joke. I, it, it's just really odd, really odd sequence. I mean, this film is very deconstructed. There's a reason we compare it to heavy metal, yeah, because it 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 is a series of vignettes essentially. Yes, and in yes. that sense, I suppose it's quite similar to the comics. But this scene feels especially egregious because Fritz is barely in it. Yeah. There's a whole dumb thing where he's hiding in the bathroom, the ladies' bathroom. Oh, yeah, and he woman. seduces someone in there. I don't know if he seduces, because when they come out, she's sitting on top of him. And I don't what know. Does she seduce him? Well, first of all, she shrieks because he's gone in the women's bathroom. And then the cop, the the one of the cops kicks the other cop in there, or yells at, mm -hmm. yells at one of the cops. The cop gets knocked in there, and then they come out. Now she's in a state of undress, and she's passionately kissing the cop oh, that went in. Okay. So, not even Fritz... It's all just very odd and what a big mess. Yeah, it, it is a big mess. Fritz goes home. His roommates are studying for exams. He's pissed off that this all they like, care about is exams. This is like Fritz bugs out. Yep. He sets fire to his papers by with fire breath. 
yeah. by accident. He doesn't do it on purpose, it seems like. No. He is getting angry about society and... And we get we get an okay sequence here where he's against a black background, cheap to animate, I suppose, uh, and where he's sort of wandering around and having a monologue. Mm. And again, this monologue is very much like the sorts yep. of things that Fritz says in the comic, and yet we're getting an animated spin on it. Yes. He's, uh, you know, interacting with swirling papers. He's striding about a black background as he, you know, spills force forth his inner thoughts. Mm. This is fine. Yep. I like it when the film does stuff like this because yes. it feels like, ah, this is what, this isn't just porn. <laughs> <laughs> this is, this was the aim. Yes. To, to tell an adult story in this medium that you couldn't tell in a different Yes. Way. Well, the next scene too, because this scene just ends. Fire starts the end. He goes on to the next scene, which yeah. is he, he goes to the Black Crows bar. Yeah. And there he meets this character named Duke, who's playing yeah. pool. In the comic, they're, they just sit at the bar and talk. Here he's playing billiards. Um, bit too much of the focus on the billiards balls flying around, I think. But yeah. obviously, Baxter is like, well, here's some visual movement yeah. that we're going to put in here. Animation! Yes. <laughs> it turns, but it turns into a big bar fight when Fritz is accidentally insulting to the bartender. And. Um, Duke has to get him out of there. Now, as in the comic, when they leave, they steal a car. Yeah. And Fritz insists on driving. Uh, this is the scene where they... And there's a big car chase sequence cop here, shop, which is yeah. in the comic as well. There's a big car chase as they leave. Same cop shop. Same cop shop, They've cop's been shop, reassigned. Yeah. So some time has passed because they've been reassigned to Harlem. Oh, right. Presumably after they caused ruc a ruckus in the synagogue. Okay. And they're not happy about it because I, I think they perceive it as being very dangerous. Right. Yeah, well, there's a scene here where they, they go... This is where the alley scene is, where the guy just pops out and shoots up out of a yeah. garbage can for no reason. Yeah. Uh, okay, they... Duke and Fritz end up at this jazz club. Yes. Where there's this lady named Bertha, and Bertha's like, we haven't had any cats around here. <laughs> Literal cats. In a long time, the cats have the money, right? Mm. She wants some cats to come... When she, now, when Duke brings Fritz to this bar, she spies him, and she has a very sinister look, like, aha... I can fleece this guy. Yep. This goes nowhere. It doesn't come up again. Because yeah. as in the comic, she gets up, she dances and she offers him a joint. In this in the movie, they say, Have you ever smoked? He says, Of course I have. Are you kidding? And yep. she sh shoves six joints into his mouth. They have a very long now we have a crazy pot sequence, an LSD psychedelic yep. sequence. It just goes on for a very long time. Pink elephants on parade. He has not had LSD. He's had he's smoked marijuana. So I don't know what... This is Reefer Madness kind of era. You could plausibly guess... believe that a person could get... Could hallucinate maybe you could, Maybe you could assume the audience would believe that, but I have trouble believing that Bakshi thought that this was the... What it would no, be like to his, smoke. This is his... This is, uh, this is a sequence... This is what animation can do, right? Yeah. This is what TV Tropes calls mushroom samba. Right. <laughs> <laughs> this is like in Dumbo when Dumbo drinks yeah, yeah. alcohol. Yeah, right. Alcohol doesn't make you hallucinate. Yes. But eat the pink elephants. Pink elephants yeah, on parade. Yeah. Here we come. It's just like that. Right. He's right. saying, look, we can do this, but we can do it in this time it's adults. Yeah. In an adult situation. So now there's a very long sequence where they, where Bertha and Fritz are going through this junkyard. He's kind of trying to. He's seduce trying to seduce her. her. He's become mad from the marijuana. From the marijuana. He's been Lots turned into a rutting animal. strange breasts. Like, he stretches her breasts out in these she, weird she, like, shapes. She, whacks and... him with her breasts. Yeah. The bizarre stuff. Yeah. Very strange. But it does lead up to the sex scene, which is in the comic, which, when he has sex with her. Yep. And then he has the light bulb moment where he realizes there needs to be a revolution. He's in, he's in the middle of coitus, yes. and then he, he just sort of, oh, I need to go and... Foment revolution. Yes. But this here's my point is that again we had the sequence where Bertha eyes him with a sinister look as if she's gonna fleece him for his money, and that never play it just plays out like the comic the rest of the way. Yeah. I to yes, I think you're right. At, I completely think you're right. When I watched it I thought uh she maybe just wanted to seduce him. I mean it's pretty clear that she that the good times were when people the the cats the fat cats were spending money in the club mm. and that's not happening now she sees him and for me it was enough that um there was a blurring of her interest mm. in him economically you might say as well as sexually okay i for me that was that was yeah, fine i didn't see that look in her eyes but anyway it doesn't really no no, no i mean she's she's ever 
it's avarice. Yeah. But there's enough there's enough of a blur that okay. that her interest can can be sexual as well. Okay. As, so Fritz gets up on a soapbox, he starts calling for a vote, much as like he does in the comic, but different from the comic, this leads to a race riot yeah. where Duke is killed and the billiard balls come back in a visual metaphor, which I thought, okay, I it's forgive cool. your earlier yeah. billiard balls, spending too much time on them. It's kind of forgiven. It slows yeah. down. It's quite a resting sequence, actually. Yeah. yeah. In more than one way. Duke is killed, the <laughs> army flies in, there's like jets and stuff. Uh, with uh, uh, Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, yes, in and, a silhouette, uh, che cheering on yeah. the uh, jets yeah. as they drop bombs on Harlem. Yeah. Uh, okay, now bizarre smash cut to a biker in the desert wearing a swastika on his jacket and a. Oh, wow, does that happen here? Right. Okay. Oh yeah, and then uh, then there's this a girl horse who hears the noise and gets a drug needle and go, climbs up on a hill, the noise of the motorbike outside, yeah. climbs up on a hill and flashes it in a way that the reflection catches in the rear view mirror, the handlebar mirror of the motorbike and the motorbiker goes up and picks her up. I'm like, what is this from? It doesn't become clear until later. So... A Harriet the horse? Yes. Fritz is on the run. Uh, we get the scene in the garbage can where he... Oh, Duke... Uh, yeah, sorry, go. I was going to say... You already mentioned that Duke was shot yes. and, and killed, yeah. Uh, this is where he meets Winston. She finds him. Dialogue is almost word for word out of the comics, mm -hmm. especially in this scene. Yes. He's in a garbage can. He's and in the he garbage invites can. her to jump in the garbage can with him. And they talk about... In the comic, there's like four black panels with just dialogue balloons where they're in the garbage can here. Well, you can't have that in it. she has all sorts of weird swirling lights. He Fantasia, does it many times in the movie. Fantasia-style stuff. Yeah. Uh, there's one background I noticed that was like, uh, when you're a kid, do you ever do the thing where, in school, where you shave, like, a crayon, uh, and you put the shavings on wax paper, and then use iron, and you melt it, and you get these weird, swirly kind of, uh, colors? <laughs> there's something like that in this right. background of this movie. Yes. Um, okay, so here's where, okay, so she, he ends up on the road with Winston, much as in the comic. Um, they go to a diner. It's all plays are very much like the comic, but then their car breaks down. He goes up the road with the, after the uh, truck driver comes by with his chickens on the back and tells them about the water. This, he goes up the road with. And the then again, there's a there's a bizarre like it ruins it, frankly, because the the point of the scene in the comic was that it was Winston and Fritz that were the fools. Yeah, in judging this hillbilly and thinking he couldn't know anything about mm. anything whereas in fact he knows everything there is to know about engines mm. and he doesn't need to know everything there is to know about engines he just has to know that they need water in yeah. the radiator yeah in this case they say that they run out of petrol why that change i yeah, don't know yeah i guess because it makes him look even more dumb then why is he going up the road with a bucket to put petrol in it in the bucket yeah okay. that's stupid no that doesn't make sense you're right odd change but here, it's undermined by making the hillbilly a lunatic. Right. Because he beats his chickens to death. Because they're clucking. Yes. Why is this in the film? Yeah. I guess because it's funny. <laughs> and, oh, oh, this is a grown-up animation because it has a man beating a... Mm. Well, a dog man beating a chicken coop full of chickens to death. So, this is why it's rated X? Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah, bizarre. <laughs> it completely ruins the scene. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so Fritz, as in the comic, gets fed up with carrying this bucket and throws it and decides to go off. But he doesn't ride the rails in this case. He We get a bizarre sequence here where he starts walking up the road with yeah. no bucket. And then we see his we see this as a ref, his reflection in the water of a toilet bowl. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, is he in the toilet? It's not him in the toilet. It's no. Harriet the horse. Yeah. I'm like, wait, this has nothing... He's not there? What is this? It's just a transition. Meaning? It's a bizarre a meaningless transition, transition. Meaningless transition. Again, look, this is an... We can animate this transition. Yeah. Instead of having a smash cut. Yeah. Hey, look, he's in the toilet bowl. Yeah. So, he ends up bumping into Fuzz, the bunny, the Nazi biker bunny. So, the revolutionaries here are Nazis? They're neo-Nazis. Neo-Nazis, not left-wing. No. And which is funny, because one of Crumb's problems with this movie was that um, he felt that it was taking the piss out of the left wing. Right. Because he's a man of left wing sympathies. And I don't 
think that <laughs> because the villains are neo Nazis. Yeah. Yeah. They were they were kind of hapless um, weekend socialists, or you yeah. know, in in the comic. Yeah, yeah. But in this, they're kind of like nasty neo Nazi uh, yeah. terrorists, essentially. But, yes. Weird to say they're the villains of the movie because this is ten minutes from the end. Yeah. Yeah. So he yeah. hooks up with this group. Now, the revolutionaries here are not some in some apartment in Brooklyn. It's in a church. They're in a cemetery. Oh, cemetery, yeah. They're in a graveyard. Yeah. And, and this is like a, And this the is head like a revolutionary castle. is not like this guy with a beard. It is the Grim Reaper. Yeah. And then it re it's revealed to be this woman. Well, there's also a woman. A oh, there's also a woman. So the Grim Reaper is somebody who else. It looks like a... Yeah, they're, they're both lizards, but one of them is always in a cloak. They're yeah. in, a, in a graveyard and a, a, a crypt... Yes. I suppose. Yeah. So this is one step away from a fantasy castle. Mm. So here it's become, you know, it's become very Disney esque. Yeah. This is like the the sorcerer or the sorceress in their dark tower. Yeah. It's fucking weird. Very frankly. very weird change. We've had all this commentary, sort of quote unquote it, commentary on sixties culture. Considering how grounded it's been in the sixties, yes, exactly. and a lot of re reviews comment on this film's artistic value being in how much of a slice of nineteen sixties. America, uh, New York it manages to preserve through mm. through its um you know a lot of the backgrounds were are rotoscoped photos right well I don't know if you rotoscope a photo but trace photos yeah. essentially yeah. like Bakshi went around yeah. took a photos of a bunch of New York streets and they just traced over them mm. and they formed the backgrounds and then to kind of have the climax set in a crypt that's like a dark really, tower like on the top of the hill cartoon. like a Scooby Doo cartoon yeah very odd very odd uh. They, um, much like the comic, Harriet is... Harriet is assaulted, but this time... First she's beaten up. She's beaten savagely up. Savagely with a chain. She's chained up, but it plays differently because yes. for several reasons. One is, this time she's being assaulted by Nazis, one of whom is a woman. Yeah. Maybe, maybe coded as lesbian. I'm not sure. Yeah. And she's throwing all sorts of slurs out at them, which are probably not slurs at the time in 72. Um, yeah. it... Sexuals, uh, orientation. Yeah, slurs. she uses the F slur. Yep. Uh, and, and then the big thing is Fritz is like, "Stop! Don't no. hurt her." Instead of leading the uh, assault, uh, and incidentally, in the comic, it's heavily implied that Harriet enjoys started enjoying it. Yeah, yeah. But here, this is it's not like Fritz is no. trying to stop it. Yeah, half heartedly, and then afterwards, she's in utter like she did. She's in shell shock, Harriet. Yeah, and like Fritz is trying to console her. He leaves his jacket with her. Yeah, and then when they go to plant this bomb, Fritz is still, like, shook up about what happened to Harry. This is, like, a motivating yes. force. And that, which is why he decides not to go through with it. Yeah. Or at least it's part of the reason why. So, um, there's a double cross. The lizard lady, uh, lights the fuse before Fritz is down from planting the dynamite in the power station. Fritz has already had a change of heart. He's trying to pull the dynamite out. But it's stuck. It's stuck. Uh, the fuse travels up. Yeah. We get a... Again, this is a pretty good animated kind of sequence. We can see the fuse, the lip fuse mm -hmm. getting closer and closer to where Fritz is. He's still struggling to pull it, the dynamite out. He can't get it out. He sees it. It goes into the dynamite. He says, is it all nuts or something like that? I can't remember something. Oh, no. He says, far out. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> far but out. But he gives a speech beforehand yeah. about how you get the love that you give or all this kind of yeah. stuff that doesn't have much to do with anything. Right. It, it seems but, like he's learned some sort of lessons on yeah. his journey of the that's past the point. It, well, 80 minutes. It. It's a it's another part of the, the kind of like a ham fisted effort. Yeah. To give this film a kind of continuity. So here he's realized something. He's realized that what's important is not a bunch of late sixties bullshit, mm -hmm. but what's important is that Harriet essentially that to love and be loved because mm -hmm. that's what Harriet is I guess he's only like, met, he, by the way he's only known her for three minutes three minutes tops yeah and most of the time which he spent half heartedly trying to save her from a gang rape yeah uh, amusingly uh, <laughs> uh, this might not be the opportune time to mention this but it's funny that um, all the male characters are usually uh, bottomless but you can't see their genitals uh or buttocks. Except most for the of the pink cops, because they're one of them. His well, they're pants not bottomless. They're wearing down. pants. Yes. So when their pants come off, you can see their genitals. Okay. So much like actual kind of like animation meant for kids. Yeah. Where Donald the, ducking it. Donald Duck can have yeah. no pants. Yeah. But 
uh, the lady ducks must be wearing skirts right. and dresses. Right. Because nothing's more terrifying than female sexuality. Uh, in this film, amusingly, it's inverted. So right. the not the women. So the men are daffy, daffy ducking it. They're fine, but the women are, are wearing are also daffy ducking it. Yeah. But you can see their yes buttocks. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so I, I like that because they've made it vi made visible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. The reason why yeah. uh, these characters are always wearing dresses and so on yes. in children's uh, media. So the bomb goes off and you think Fritz is dead or there's going to be some kind of... He was supposed to die. Nine lives gag or something. In the original um, ending, he was supposed to die okay. at this point. But then we cut to the hospital where and his three groupies from the park show up. And Harriet. Yes, and Harriet show up. They want to get in. Um, they do get in. And we get a I was cured all right kind of scene where he, he actually ends up having an orgy with these women in his hospital bed. Yeah. And that's well, how the movie is. This is his realization. He, he repeats verbatim uh, his angsty cry for help that he said to them at the very start mm. yes. of the film. I've been around the world. I've yeah. fought many fights. I've laid many women. Yeah. And I've come to realize what's important. But instead of... He says what's important is getting laid. Mm. As you say, he, so it's a kind of nice bookends. Uh, nice, I don't know. It's a bookends. Yeah. <laughs> now, what year was Clockwork Orange? Oh, I'm not sure. Was that also seventy? It was seventy something. I was cured. All right, that scene in the hospital bed where oh, he right he he's supposedly been cured, but he's uh, back to his old ways. Oh, and he he fantasizes about having that orgy with those women in the clouds. It was 71. 71. That's very astute. <laughs> and interesting, because it wasn't the original ending. He was supposed yeah, to right. die. So they've just said, I just shoved the Clockwork Orange yeah. ending in there. Yeah. That's okay. clever. That's clever. Okay. Uh, trivia? Absolutely. Okay. So you were asking, how did this get made? Yeah. Okay. So um, Steve Krantz, the producer, and Ralph Bakshi, they were kind of a creative team. Mm -hmm. uh, Bakshi, as we've mentioned, is... What, he believes in the potential of animation yeah. as a medium for telling stories outside of kind of like the sterile childlike mm -hmm. technically proficient vision that Disney is presenting at the time uh, they're looking for something to adapt yeah a bit like last week with the creative duo yeah right where they were too were looking for a kind of yeah. like a, a, a comic an adult comic story to adapt mm. uh, here there's there's um it's not quite sure who finds the comic first. Mm. I've read both versions, where it was uh, Bakshi that found it, where it was Krantz that found it. In any case, one of them found it, and then they got in touch with Robert Crumb, wanting to adapt it. Okay. And what seems to have happened here is that Crumb is not interested. Okay. Or he's kind of... He's, he's not sure. Mm. Right? He's sort of sympathetic to the idea, yeah. but he doesn't really want anything to do with it. And what seems to have happened is that Bakshi, as the as a kind of alpha personality, has browbeaten him into okay. it. Okay. Literally browbeaten him into it. So, like, time and again, they would meet up and, you know, like, allegedly... A lot of this coming from the Barrier article that was published in Funny World in 72 or 73. Uh, Bakshi and Crumb would meet up, meet up and Crumb would say, oh, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't think I really want this to happen. And Bakshi would say, but everyone's done so much work, let's do a, let us do a little more... Mm -hmm. And then we'll show you what we've got. And it would continue on and continue on and continue mm -hmm. on. Eventually, and they also had... Uh, Bakshi and Krantz had a lot of trouble attracting uh, kind of like money for yeah. this film as well, as you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, unprecedented, right? This absolutely movie. unprecedented. Yeah. There's no adult animation. Yeah. There hasn't been any, ever. Mm. Or, or since, like, the animation first appeared in, like, mm. the, what, the 10s, 20s, yeah. 30s? Yeah. It's completely unheard of. They can't find a distributor. No one wants to do an adult cartoon. Eventually, Warner Brothers signed on, but then pulled out. Okay. Because um, Bakshi refused to tone down the sex or cast big name voices. Okay. I, I mean, on the one hand, why not tone down the sex? On the other hand, I admire not mm. casting big name voices. Mm. You know, like, oh, you gotta get. Like, who would be a big name voice in 1972? You gotta get James Earl Jones! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, but so, but they still, like Crumb still hasn't signed the contract. Mm. They eventually fly to San Francisco where he's living at the time with his then wife Dana 
Again, they're browbeating him. Again, it doesn't happen. Mm. They fly back to New York. Then somehow they end up with a contract. Yes. Now, it's not... No one can really agree what happened here. Okay. What did happen is that they ended up with a contract that was legally unchallengeable. So legally, yeah. it happened. Right. They, have the, they had the rights. Right. And they could make the film. Yeah. What's uncertain is how they got it. Okay. So... What happened? Did Bakshi just, like, literally force... I, thought, I saw somewhere that Dana had power of attorney and she sold them the rights. Yes. Okay. So this is the version on Wikipedia. Okay. And the source for this, again, is the Barrier article from okay. Funny World. Okay. And Barrier, who doesn't like Bakshi and likes Crumb... Okay. ...repeats... Uh, ...was in correspondence with Crumb... Okay. ...after he published the article. In the article, he mentions that it's not certain how this happened. Okay. Just that it was legally unassailable. Mm -hmm. After the article was published, Crumb sent him a letter, basically praising the article mm -hmm. and explaining what happened. As you said, that his wife, then wife Dana, had power of attorney. She was his business partner, mm -hmm. as well as his life partner at the time. She wanted cash. Yeah, sure. At that time, they were well off because, ironically, Fritz the Cat apparently had sold well in the late 60s. Okay. And they were able to buy three acres of land in California, okay. apparently. Yeah. But here's what Crumb said. I never signed anything. I've been reluctant to let the truth be known. Because, and this is important, I didn't want anybody thinking bad things about my dear wife, whom I love and cherish. Mm -hmm. But see, that time when back she came out to, Cal to San Francisco to get me to sign the contract, I ran off and left him with my wife. Now, I'd hashed it over with her, and she knew I didn't want to do it but she was somewhat hot for the money mm. as we were trying to get this farm going and all. And I didn't really expect her to understand my objection from my artistic attitude mm. at all. So there I went and left her holding the bag. And while she sympathized with my reluctance, she gave in to Ralph's incessant badgering, but only after two days of it and signed the contract herself using my power of attorney, which I had given her. Right. There's a lot in this paragraph. Yeah. First of all, he's kind of saying, I didn't want to do it, but I let her do it. Right. I was happy for her to do it, but not me. Mm. Then I could be artistically yes. uncompromised. Yes. Second of all, there's he says, I didn't want anybody thinking bad things about my dear wife, whom I love and cherish. When Crumb sent this letter to... Barrier. Barrier. He was absolutely not on good terms with his wife. Huh, he'd, okay. he'd left her. Yeah. In fact, they had an unhappy marriage. Yeah, yeah. And he'd left her at this point. Yeah. So this is, frankly, bullshit. Uh. <laughs> So I wonder how true this is. Yeah. This is a version that makes Crumb look, I suppose, good. Yeah, yeah. I, my, I, obviously you can't know, and, and there's no way to know. It's just one of those historical mysteries. But my guess would be that he signed it, hmm. okay. and then felt bad about it afterwards. Hmm. But he, as you said, an introverted, kind of uh, easily browbeaten yeah. personality type. Yeah. But actually the complete opposite. Yeah. Apparently he really gives you the treatment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when you meet him, he has a yeah. very overwhelming personality. Right. We've got. I've read articles, review. Uh, I've read interviews where people are writing about interviewing him in his like late seventies, mm. and he's just like <laughs> hammering them yeah. with all this, these swears, like his opinions of Crumb, mm. all this stuff. So yes, that seems to be what occurred. Okay. But what is definitely a matter of historical record is what is Crumb's immediate regret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he hated this film. Yeah. Uh, and it's the beginning of kind of like a lifelong enmity mm. between uh, Bakshi and Crumb. Mm. They've both, they just, neither of them let it go. Okay, well, what's Bakshi's issue with Crumb? I understand the Crumb's issue with Bakshi. Uh, so, Crumb's bad... issue with Bakshi is that he made a bad film. Yeah. That also that the film wasn't true to yep. Fritz the Cat. Yeah. That Fritz said and did things that Crumb wouldn't have had him say mm -hmm. and do. Mm -hmm. That was rough on the left wing when Crumb's sympathetic to the left wing. And that Bakshi is the antithesis of Crumb, the artist, mm -hmm. because Bakshi is like a money-grubbing yep. Hollywood type. Okay. Bakshi says um, the opposite, yeah, essentially. He says, I'm the artist, actually. Okay. I made this great film. Okay. Well, I made a film. This film... Okay. This film made money. Yeah. This film made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. He says, I I made Crumb famous, you know. Okay. And now and and now I'm the bad guy. So he thinks that Crumb's an ingrate. Partly. That's his issue. Oh, you can find endless, endless stuff okay. where they're talking about it. You know, you know, he he just it it seemed look, back she says that he's a hypocrite. Right. He likes money. He took the advance, so when he signed the contract, apparently he received an advance of 
something around fifty to sixty thousand dollars okay. US, which is pretty good. Yeah, nineteen seventy two dollars. Yes, it's a pretty respectable amount of money. And then may or may not have received money based on how successful the film. Okay. Did. Trump says no, I never got any money. Okay. Just says yeah, of course he got money. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but actually says he, he's he, he finds him infuriating because he thinks he's a hypocrite. Oh, okay. Because okay. he's pretending to be artistically pure when he's perfectly happy to make money off mm. the film. Uh, you, you, he says that um, Crumb is slick, hustler, okay. always comes out of deals looking good and with money. And interviewers have said, but that's the opposite of of what Crumb is, right? Isn't yeah. he a sort of a bumbler, a not, like a, a a kind of hapless? man out of time to which back she replies quote that's his thing he has a chateau in france yeah where he drinks wine every day and he's supposed to be in the underground no one succeeds to the extent that robert crumb has without being slick but to him i'm just the guy that ruined fritz the cat so do i like robert crumb no i think he's a hustler i know he's a hustler i have no respect for crumb is he a good artist yes if you want to do the same thing over and over <laughs> Uh, a critique that could equally be applied to Bakshi. He could have been my best... He should have been my best friend for what I did with <laughs> Fix the Cat. I drew a good picture and we both made out fine. Why do I get this angry? I was thumbing through a book he put out just a few months ago and of course he's yelling at me again, saying he feels sorry for me, saying that I'm the worst artist he's ever met, saying that I ruined his cat. Hmm. Uh, I will say that we know exactly how Crumb got that chateau in France, because it's in the documentary, he traded two sketchbooks for it. <laughs> or one sketchbook. Brilliant. It was one to two maximum sketchbooks traded for a chateau in France. So, I mean, talk about artistic integrity. He just traded his art for it. Hmm. There was no hustling to <laughs> yeah. get dough. If you, in this cigar, there was no cigar chomping involved. In 2008, Bakshi won the Inkpot Award. Okay. which I think is a Comic-Con related uh, award might be, yeah. that is given to people that are active in animation mm. and or cartooning. At that point, there is kind of like a blitz of interviews with Bakshi, mm. who then was living in semi-retirement mm. in New Mexico. Okay. And in all of these interviews, he just absolutely unloads on Crumb. <laughs> he always mentions the fucking Chateau. <laughs> Bizarre. He, he also mentions the documentary a lot. Okay. He calls him a hypocrite. Because uh, Crumb's always accusing Bakshi of being like a money grubber, mm -hmm. like a sellout and stuff. And Bakshi will just go, absolutely go off the rails every time. He talks about the documentary especially. He says, I would never invite a camera into my house uh, and film my family in order to become famous again in the 90s. Jesus. I, you know, he says, do you know his brother committed suicide after that film happened? Yeah. Implying that it's... Well, you know what? This is documented too because Zweigoff was... Of course. Super depressed. Yeah. And was worried about killing himself and felt adrift. And Crumb was like, okay, you can make this documentary. So he yeah. did it for Zweigoff. Yeah. Well, so he would Bakshi have a direction. Thinks, yeah. Well, <sighs> unbelievable. From, from Bakshi. <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> Bakshi thinks, uh, yeah. Bakshi thinks that Crumb thinks like him. I suppose. That's what it is. He thinks Crumb is somebody. For Bakshi to get a. to have a documentary made of his life. He would have to be in a position where he needed to be famous. Or if he wanted a chateau, he would have to do some sort of major sellout instead of just trading two sketchbooks for a chateau. Uh, that is... That, there's no way to come down on Bakshi's <laughs> side in this. It's just hilarious. Yeah. Well, what's hilarious is that they're both... It, it's funny because they're both such opposites. Yeah. <laughs> and yet they're kind of the same in how much they hate one another. Yeah. Because Crumb never misses an opportunity to unload on Bakshi. It's been yeah. 50 years, yeah. you know, but he never misses an opportunity. In the film, like the documentary, mm. he complains about Bakshi. Whenever he publishes a book, a new book of cartoons or something, he'll always complain about Bakshi. Mm. And the same is true. Bakshi will always complain about mm. Crumb. They just cannot live. There's like two old men just <laughs> Bizarre. like throwing shit at one another. Right. Over and over and over. They both just seem equally kind of annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but to back to how this movie made money. So this film was made on an absolute shoestring budget. There's not a consensus on precisely how much it cost, but it definitely cost less than a million US mm. in 1972 dollars. The figure Wikipedia quotes is 700,000. It's good as any. It made about 90 million dollars. Whoa. Okay. Wow. Domestically and internationally. Wow. Like it 
absolute like that's so much money yeah this is a massive massive success it's so many you know it at that point it was the most successful non-disney animated film ever released right. yeah uh it was all sorts of firsts you know it was uh definitely the first successful animated film for adults mm -hmm. uh the first animated film to have an x rating yep uh, it was the first animated film that wasn't a studio film that didn't come from okay, one of the big right, studios interesting. Yeah. because uh, Bakshi just made it with his production company with uh, Kurtz Krantz mm. Mm. Uh, and they kind of financed it independently mm. uh, their distributor they eventually attracted after Warner Brothers fell through was a grindhouse kind okay. of like distributor yeah. called Cinemation Industries okay so I don't know if you've heard of them, but no. they, at the time they specialised in exploitation films. Okay. They did Sweet Swedeback's Badass. Yeah, that's a, the first black exploitation yeah. picture. So they, this was the distributor for that. By, uh, so they thought it would fit in Melvin with their... Van Peebles, yeah. They thought it would fit in with their thing. Okay. With their but the word book. cinemation was not related to animation? That's bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> Just a coincidence. That's weird. Just a coincidence. But yeah, they... You know, they... It was just made independently. Yeah. In fact, they they had to move to California halfway through the animation process because their animators that they had in New York kept quitting, mm. either because they were prudes or because they were too into it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to draw animal mm. tits. Right, right. <laughs> so I had to keep sacking them. Jesus. Okay. <laughs> yeah, amazing. So, as you said, uh, so Crumb fucking hates the movie. Yeah. <laughs> So he really, as you said, he deliberately killed the character yeah. in that story, Fritz the Cat Superstar, where Fritz is literally a movie star in that iteration, mm. uh, gets stabbed through the head like Trotsky with an ice pick. <laughs> and although he does have a scene in the comic where he meets with some Hollywood hotshots to discuss his next movie, and their names are Ralphie... Mm -hmm. And Stevie. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, was there some Japan connection of some sort you were going to mention? Thank you so much for mentioning that. So this film, of course, because this film did so well, it's got its imitators. Okay. So we have a slew after this of utterly forgettable... If you loved Fritz the Cat, you'll love... Okay. You know, mm -hmm. X the Y, all of which are forgotten today. Yeah. With very few exceptions. One of which is... Uh, the most famous and enduring is called Down and Dirty Duck. Okay. Never heard of that? No. No, I've chucked it on the cheat list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, among these hastily thrown together animated films for adults were two dubbed movies from Japan. Okay. By Osamu Tezuka. Okay. Himself. Called Sinya Ichiya Monogatari. Okay. And Kurio Patra. Kurio Patra, I know this one. Yes. So they were retitled in English. A Thousand and One Nights, and Cleopatra, Queen of Sex. So I've heard of the Cleopatra one for sure, yeah. So apparently, uh, Tezuka, going through a Bakshi phase, yeah, right. made three animated okay. films aimed essentially like for adults, okay. not just kids. Yeah. Uh, apparently, the, the, uh, much, the, the distinguishing feature is that they had, had breasts. Right, <laughs> okay. So there you go, but thanks to Fritz the Cat. Huh. They're released in English briefly in the mid seventies, right? But they were they produced after Fritz the Cat because of Fritz the Cat, no, or were they? They'd already they were been dubbed, made and right, they were quickly got, dubbed. Got it. Okay. And thrown out on the market as if they were part of Fritz the Cat. Yeah. Wave. You loved got Fritz you. the Cat. Yeah. Then you you're gonna love Patra. Curio Patra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this completely unrelated film that yeah. has to do with Tezuka's yeah. own preoccupations. Yeah. And nothing to do with. Yeah. Bakshi yeah. or Crumb yeah. or, or the American context at the time. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, do our ratings. Okay. Um, so the comics, uh, for me, these aren't my favorite no. Crumb comics. As I said, I like the 80s period. Um, there are some good bits, but those good bits appear in either Crumb comics, and you can skip these, I think. I'm the same. I don't particularly like these. I think they're a bit... There's some odd moments. Yeah. That are funny, yeah, but mostly they're a bit. They're very kind of like journeyman or neat kind of like efforts. Yeah, it's not even his best art, which you know is no. the '80s period again. Is for me when he really is the wheels are spinning. Yeah, there's not. There's I don't. There's nothing really to recommend them. 
I don't think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this movie. <laughs> uh, yeah. This movie is a nay. Yeah. For me. Uh, it's very, very rough around the edges. Very rough. I find it pretty gross. Yeah. That's like, I find thing. the, 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 junkyard sex scene where he's like playing with her breasts in these weird way like I was that stuff was gross and all the I'm not the prude, were but gross. I was yeah. yeah grimacing a lot uh this, it's very scathologic well not the, the urinating yeah like, why is there so much urinating yeah it, it just seems shocking for shocking's sake yes. a lot of the time uh, yeah I think it's it, this is an edgelord movie for yeah sure. and I mean yeah I was often... why does it why why do all the women's breasts get exposed as you know, and it happens once or twice. Just, okay, but now it's this is a cartoon animal, yeah. and we're seeing it's it's like the the Howard the Duck breasts. Yeah. Like, what, yes. what, what are it's we gratuitous. looking at? It's completely gratuitous. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, plus, you know, I mean, it's it's showing its cheapness. Yeah. As well, because the animation at times is really. Like oh the, yeah. So many backgrounds bad. are just nonsense backgrounds. Uh, the art is very poor at times. Yeah. Like they've done one, they haven't, like Bakshi's not spent any money. Yeah. No one's gone back and said, hey, there's a lot of lime boil here. You know? <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, or, you know, like there's no continuity between, yeah. it's like, no, 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 we don't have time for this. I've only got $700,000. Print it. Yeah. Onto the next scene. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like, fine, but it, it doesn't make for... No, it's... i never watch this again. No, no, I can't see myself watching it again. And, of course, any appeal... I mean, it's... it's yeah, you've, it just feels pretty gratuitous. Yeah, yeah. And unpleasant yeah. But times. it thinks it's awesome. <laughs> well, I mean, it's partly, I think, the context, yeah. again. Yeah. And, I mean, in this movie's defence, there's nothing like it in 1972. Yeah, that's true. I even uh, Barrier in Funny World, who's not a big fan of the movie, says Fretz is a messy and imperfect picture, and it bears the scars of its difficult birth. But it has the energy of a good idea behind it, mm -hmm. and that is enough mm -hmm. for it to mm -hmm. be outstanding hmm. at a time when most animated cartoons are made out of habit. Yeah, literally outstanding. For, or Exceptional. For a, yeah, yeah, or for a quick buck. Yeah, yeah. And I, I suppose that leads into: Is it a good adaptation? I don't think so. I think. The addition of the cops is a real mess. Hmm. Um, I think changing Fritz into a hero at the end, a noble protector, violates that self-centered, selfish, rapist character. That's a good point. Yep. I mean, that wasn't the original ending that he had envisioned. He wanted him to explode. I don't know if he would right. deliver that, that uh, how you say, that redemptive yeah. speech in the original version. I don't know, but... Bakshi was in favour of the change after he was persuaded to do it. Right, okay. For me, <clears throat> much like heavy metal, I think that this is actually a pretty... I think this is a good... I think this is an okay adaptation. Okay. I'm going to say yay. Okay. Because I think it's achieved what Bakshi set out to do, which is to tell this story, mm -hmm. this, com this story which in the comic was a story for adults, mm -hmm. full of swearing, full of adult content, mm -hmm. and tell it in animation... Mm -hmm with animation style and with kind of like animation animated expression effectively mm. so he there are things in there that could only be done in animation yes and he's telling this adult story and it's fine i feel like it's actually a pretty okay way i mean if you had to string together these disparate comics which were written across four years mm. five years mm. essentially starring the same character but in different roles as you pointed out I think you could do certainly do a lot worse. I think he did okay. Yeah. I think you, you've got a narrative that makes a certain amount of sense. Yeah. And I get, as far as accuracy is concerned, you've got a lot of the dialogue from the comics, so a lot of the sens sensibility remains. Mm -hmm. We get a sense of uh, Crom's skewering of hippie pretentiousness, of Fritz's own self-obsession, his pomposity, I feel is all there. If he's made more likeable by his come to Jesus moment. Mm. I don't think it's necessarily to the detriment of mm. of uh, him as of of the film. And uh, there's one scene where he fucks a giant fat chick in a dream sequence. Oh, so there's right. Crumb's vision right there. <laughs> yes. So for me I'm coming down yay. <laughs> okay, interesting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, okay, please like, rate, review, subscribe on whatever your platform of choice is. 
Please join us on Facebook for memes and links. Please join us on Instagram for reels. Maybe someday I'll start putting reels back on there. <laughs> uh, please look at our Twitter or the show notes to DM or email us. Um, please join our Patreon because we need the money. We need for, the dough. We need the dough for hosting. We need the dough, TVs, man. Books. <laughs> DVD. Dig it. Dig it. <laughs> Cat. Um, is that it? I think so. Yes. Okay. Next week we will do American Splendor. Amazing. Which also has a Crumb connection. The Return of Robert Crumb. Uh, I have a lot to say about it, but I'll... S as preamble, but I will save it for next week. Fantastic. Fantastic.